Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Claire, for that lovely introduction. Uh, absolute pleasure to be here. Um, I'm delighted today to be talking to our two Decade of Change series winners, Ligia Poplowska and Cynthia Maiwasasai. So, Decade of Change is, as Claire very kindly let put it, um, a global photography award and collaborative exhibition dedicated to the defining issue of our time, climate change. The award exists as part of British Journal of Photography's annual international awards programme, which includes Portrait of Britain, Portrait of Humanity, uh, British Journal of Photography International Award, Female in Focus and Open Walls. Um, spanning humankind to wildlife and cityscapes to ecosystems, Decade of Change explores the many facets of the climate crisis the strength and fragility of the natural world, the indirect impacts on communities and everyday people, and our global efforts to turn things around. Those of you who have a chance to explore Belfast Photo Fest over the next couple of days uh, across the summer, um, Decade of Change um, have been on show at Donegal Keys next to the iconic Big Fish, um, for those of you who know Belfast or have been to Belfast. So please do have a look if you're in the area in the next few weeks. Um, so needless to say, climate change will have and currently has a huge impact on the world we live in. According to the Center for Biological Diversity, global warming is projected to commit over one third of the Earth's animal and plant species to extinction by 2050. Now trying to understand the impact this will have on all life on Earth is simply too overwhelming to comprehend, which is why unfortunately too many people tend to turn a blind eye. Plus we're humans, right? We're above nature. We are on a separate plane of existence. Obviously, that's not true. Um, and the two fabulous artists I will be speaking to today illustrate perfectly how climate change is already affecting um, humanity, whether it be from a physical or a psychological perspective. Climate change is projected to not only affect our food and water supplies, our homes with rising sea levels and our quality of life um, with more erratic weather, but it is also likely to cause an increase in inequality, political unrest and issues related to mental health. For example, in a study of 10,000 young people, 59% were very or extremely worried about climate change. Now onto our fabulous artists this evening. Um, Ligia is a multi-award winning photographer whose winning body of work, Fading Senses, looks at a relatively new term, solastasia. Now Ligia will be talking about this in more detail shortly, but to summarise, it is the emotional distress caused by the loss of ecosystems and is characterised by a perspective of a fading world, a lived experience of loss of the present. Cynthia, um, hello to both of you, um, is a Kenyan British documentary photographer whose work integrates photography and text and explores themes of stereotypes, prejudice and discrimination. Her winning body of work, uh, If This Is Human, A Great Curiosity, which you will also be talking about in more detail shortly, focuses on the impact that rising temperatures have on a small group of people in Kenya, people with albinism. Now, I've seen somebody asking now already in the Q&A box, um, we will be taking questions at the end of our discussion. Um, and before we have our chat, um, both Lydia and Cynthia will tell us a little more about their work. Um, so, Throughout our discussion, throughout Ligia and Cynthia's presentation, please do send us a question um, and we'll go through as many as we can at the end. But for now, I'm going to hand over to Ligia. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the introduction and for having me. I'm going to share my screen right now. I hope everybody's seeing this. Yes, we can see you. Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction and uh, for the award. I'm incredibly honored to be uh, included in this selection. And thank you everyone for coming today to, to hear a bit more about the project. Uh, yeah, my name is Ligia Popławska. I'm a Polish photographer and visual artist based in Antwerp, Belgium. Um, I graduated from uh, the Royal Academy of Fine Arts Antwerp uh, two years ago in 2020 uh, with a master's um, in photography. And before that, I studied art history at the University of Gdańsk. I work as a photographer, photo editor and uh, teacher. Um, in my work, I focus 
on uh, themes uh, such as senses, environment, memory, emotional states. But I'm also interested in, in myths, magical thinking and post-anthropocene. Um, currently, I'm drawn to uh, the subject of sensory ecology, a study of how various species adapt to the changing conditions of the environment and climate change. Um, in my photographic uh, narration, I tend to use uh, a, a language of speculation while photographing people, places, nature and objects, uh, balancing between documentary approach and staging manipulation uh, in order to create uh, one narrative. Uh, what I want to talk uh, to you about today is my project Fading Senses, uh, which I started uh, for my master's degree in photography in 2019, uh, but uh, I produced most of the works in 2020. Um, with this project, I um, raise a question, what happens if we lose our senses? Um, I started to wonder what would happen if the effects of climate change which would affect us in one uh, way or another of if the senses would simply vanish like our connection with the natural environment. Uh, I started this project with quite an abstract idea, um, the disappearance of senses. Uh, my focus was not only on the physical matter but more on an emotional state of someone who goes through lack of senses, sensory deprivation. Uh, the idea came to me as a result of my personal experience. I, um, a few years ago, I lost, uh, temporarily lost a sense of smell and it was uh, way before COVID. Uh, so this bizarre um, experience transformed drastically uh, my sensory perception and influenced uh, the way I perceive various layers of the photographic medium. Um, around the same time, uh, a tornado devastated my beloved uh, Polish forest, uh, turning nearly 9,000 hectares of land into an apocalyptic wasteland. Um, this is an image from this place. The whole area um, well, the whole ecosystem in the area perished. Um, for the first time, I've experienced what I've learned, what I've late, later learned was um, environmental anxiety, a sense of a grief uh, for the rich ecosystems which were living there, um, species of trees, fungi, insects, animals, uh, which had been either destroyed or uh, relocated. Although um, I'm not a scientist, um, I decided to, to gather more research about uh, these topics and to understand what I actually, what I felt in that time. Um, my uh, thinking path went in two ways. Uh, one, on one hand, I focused on uh, disappearance of senses and on the other, on the environmental anxiety. Um, <clears throat> uh, I started research in the field of uh, yeah, biology, uh, psychology, neurology um, on themes um, about environmental anxiety, sensory ecology, sensory perception and climate grief. Um, I looked into many papers um, which talk about Anthropocene and how uh, living in this age um, affects us um, emotionally, but also, for example, how uh, our deep memories or like how smell can uh, trigger our deep memories and how memories can heal anxiety. So um, the relation between all these uh, things together. Um, later on, I came across um, this book um, I've, uh, I've, um, I, I, oh, sorry, uh, I discovered uh, solastalgia, um, the term introduced in 2003 by Australian environmental philosopher Glenn Albrecht, uh, author of this book. 
Um, so nostalgia describes emotional distress caused by the loss of ecosystems and a sense of losing home while being in it. Anxiety for what the future holds and a sense of a climate grief um, for the world we are losing. Um, so nostalgia is a rising and alarming problem in society as we are more and more exposed to the, um, to the climate change, to the effects of the climate change. Uh, it is different though uh, than nostalgia or melancholia, which we know, uh, which describes longing or missing a loved place. So nostalgia is missing a home while being in it, a sense of longing for the reverse effects of the climate change. Um, I became interested in how anxiety affects brain mechanisms. Um, and uh, I started researching how images can trigger other senses and vision and what happens inside the brain when we are sense deprived. Uh, for example, in, when we are in total darkness, uh, completely cut off of all sensory experiences, our brain starts to um, project memories, hallucinations and intramental perception. And these things I try to uh, implement in my storytelling. Um, <clears throat> during COVID, uh, I went to a house for visually impaired in Antwerp, uh, where I met Christopher, um, who was blind since birth. It was very strange and confronting to um, get a permission to photograph someone who had never seen his own image before. Um, meeting him was very inspiring uh, as he shared with me uh, how he uses his senses, uh, living very much connected and guided by the sounds, um, scents and textures of nature. He told me that instead of having visual dreams, he would dream about these other sensations. Dream is so fundamentally important that it is found even in the people who are born blind. However, those who have um, become blind early in life, don't experience visual imagery in their dreams. Instead, they dream about these other sensations because other senses take over the visual cortex in the brain. Um, he told me that uh, he really likes the sensation that which spiders make while walking on his hand. Uh, he could not see them nor be scared of them, but he would dream later about this sensation. Uh, crucial for me was to keep the magical element um, that comes with the concept of fading senses, showing something out of place or surprising. Um, one of the ways I wish this series will be read is that everything what we see could happen in the mind of the portrayed blind person. Some, or someone who goes through uh, nostalgia, who experiences environmental anxiety. Uh, to emphasize the sensation of a dream, I looked for elements in the man-made constructions and nature, which have uh, this illusory or hallucinating element in them, like the image of the marble columns. Um, I begin to photograph situations or elements which would emotionally express the current state I was in, often first uh, imagining it or recreating it after. Uh, because I felt this nostalgia thing myself, I somehow projected uh, my own um, feeling into the project selectively, um, choosing parts of reality and combining it into a narrative. Um, the production of images was very much influenced uh, by the COVID time uh, because uh, therefore I could only uh, photograph uh, in Antwerp where I lived at that time. Uh, some images are also coming from Warsaw, which I could visit before the lockdown. Um, I focused on photographing um, illusory stability uh, and protection of various places like homes for visually impaired, space of a zoo, um, center for acrobats, some places connected to anthropocentric um, thinking, um, socialist architecture. Uh, what I enjoy about photography is the power of storytelling and speculation. 
Um, I like the fact that photographic body of work can um, is a connection of various elements of reality and time puzzled together, but each piece can hold the story on its own. Uh, as I said before, I mix uh, staging and documenting, um, and I like to fuse reality with fiction. Um, I have met um, people who appear in this series on different occasions. Um, one of the first photographs I took for this project was a portrait uh, of my friend, Laura, whose eye uh, gives an impression of fading away. So nostalgia is an increasing problem in societies affecting especially younger generation. Um, the new generation is raised uh, with a dystopian forecast uh, of the temperature rise, often being directly affected by the weather anomalies. Um, how climate change, uh, how the discussion about climate change um, and, and uh, emotional and mental health um, is very much in my view understudied um, and overlooked. Um, I hope this project will bring uh, to an attention the fragility and power of our senses and how climate change affects our emotional health. Um, this applies to us humans, but also to other species which are directly affected uh, by the climate change. Um, <clears throat> I hope, um, yeah, I hope we can um, talk about this more and put more uh, attention um, to the subject. Uh, to my surprise, a fading of senses became uh, a very common phenomenon during the pandemic. Um, this allowed me to verify my work um, and connected what was happening uh, around that time. Uh, one of the theory books which influenced a lot my thinking uh, was this book of Donna Haraway, Staying with the Trouble. Um, let's say challenging, um, going beyond the one-dimensional stories um, and uh, shifting the perspective also on another species and um, yeah. It's a very interesting book. I recommend you if you don't know it. And um, also, I think the big part of the project um, was connected with uh, my thesis work, which I've done uh, for my studies. It was called, uh, the title was Visual Storytelling Beyond Anthropocene, Here to Horse and World Without Us. I uh, focused on uh, studies on the Anthropocene and finding new narratives to talk about climate change and um, um, the future uh, on the work of Heert Horis, Belgian photographer. And this is uh, an example of an installation I did for the Peach Museum Days uh, Festival. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> I hope you, there will be some questions afterwards. Thank you so much, Ligia. Um, Cynthia, would you like to share um, your work with us? And um, as Ligia said, um, if any of you do have any questions regarding her work and her practice, please do send them in and we'll ask them at the end. Cynthia. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Ligia, that was amazing. I have many questions. <laughs> uh, I will start sharing my screen. Good evening, everyone. My name is Cynthia Maiva Sute. And before I get started, I just wanted to say thank you very much for joining us this evening and also for giving me your time. And uh, thank you, Zoe, for making this possible and the Belfast Photo Festival team for giving Ligia and I a platform. Thank you. Uh, my project, If This is a Human, A Great Curiosity, is about uh, questioning, highlighting, and understanding what impact the climate crisis has on people with albinism. But I have to say that this is not how it began. So it began with my quest and curiosity for how societies first reacted to people with albinism 
and to the, through the presence of people with albinism during the Enlightenment era and through the medium of photography and researching journal articles as well as archival materials, my hope and intention is to highlight and analyze the long history of albinism to hopefully shed a new light into the troubling dichotomies of race and skin color on, in our current climate crisis. Now, the o concise Oxford Dictionary uh, describes an albino as a person or animal having congenital absence of coloring pigment in skin hair, which are usually white or usually, oh, sorry, white or eyes which are usually pink and undoubtedly sensitive to light. And it also says that it originates, this term originates from white Negroes. So the name, uh, if this is a human agriculosity, came from a PhD thesis that I was reading. And I learned that from this thesis that I learned that the first uh, exhibition of white Negroes took place in France. And in this uh, exhibition, there was a person called Maupertuis. So Maupertuis was invited, I'm hoping I'm saying his name correctly, but Maupertuis was invited in 1746 to examine a boy who had albinism. And if I'm allowed, I'll just read his description. And he's, he described the boy as a child, the child four or five years old, a white Negro had all the traits of a Negro with very little, uh, with very white or pale skin that only enhances his ugliness. And then uh, Voltaire was also invited in 17, 1775, and he described the boy as a little white animal. So what I learned from this thesis is that neither uh, Maupertuis or uh, Voltaire could come to a, an understanding or could decide uh, whether the boy was either animal, human, or a blend of both. And then furthermore, in 1776, 1796, sorry, I'm mixing my numbers, <laughs> Henry Moss uh, began exhibiting himself uh, in Philadelphia taverns, showing how his skin has, uh, had started to turn completely white. So his skin transformation began when he developed vitiligo and gradually the patches of white would eventually uh, start to progressively turn completely white. So at the time, people didn't believe him. So he had to seek the help of a captain called Joseph Holt. And Joseph Holt, uh, who, had served, who had previously served with uh, Moss uh, in the Revolutionary War, he not only authenticated that, Holt, that Moss sorry, was, um, was black, but also that he was freeborn. So he was allowed to do whatever he pleased. And what he pleased was he decided to create this poster uh, a great curiosity and exhibit himself in different places in Philadelphia. And so many people came to see to see that he had completely turned white. And one among those people who came to see was uh, George Washington and he paid 25 cents to see uh, Moss face to face. I also just wanted to read, sorry. I also just wanted to read a little bit of what I've written here. So witness the exhibition staged before millions of, for the pleasures of philosophers and princes and literati and statements. For so long, the white Negro body has presented a fantasy of racial transformation, a belief that under the right conditions, black skin could turn white and the African would become indistinguishable from the European. I found this quote quite interesting and also with uh, the recent, I mean, not the recent, but if you've seen a lot of the movies, if you think of um, the Da Vinci Code and also the representations of people with albinism in uh, Harry Potter, you'd see that they are mostly in the 21st century, they're represented in as monsters and also as uh, looking as if they're doing evil things. Another descript description of, in the book of Enoch, Enoch sorry, uh, in the Old Testament, there was a description of Noah which read, when, when the child was born, his skin was whiter than snow and redder than rose. All his hair were white, as white snow, curly and magnificent. So people believed that Noah was also a person with albinism. So how did this project begin for me? It began in Bundani, Taita Taveta County. Sorry, it began in Bundani, Taita Taveta County where Felicia Ngoi considers her home and lives. She lived there for quite a long time until recently when she moved to Motate to work uh, as a primary school teacher in Motate Primary School. So my siblings and I moved to the United Kingdom in 2010. 
And in, 2000, in 2017, I started my master's in documentary photography at the University of South Wales. The first time I went back home was in 2000, it went back home to Kenya was in 2018 when I was working on my final year project on rape. And when I was there, I kept going back and forth. I worked with Felicia, so she helped me a lot uh, gather research and also introduced me to a, a number of different people. And Felicia is a ball of light. <laughs> She's a joy to be around and always has a smile on her face. I mean, if you look at this picture and this picture doesn't do her justice. She's sweet and caring and kind and also behaves in a childlike manner. She also told me that, she told me once that she only chooses to see the good in people and only responds to that. Anything else is a waste of time and energy. She started her own organization called Persons with Albinism, Taita Taveta County, as a safe space for people with albinism within the county to meet up and engage and also to share ideas of innovation and business, and as well as support each other. And one of the initiatives that she started was to allow for anyone in the county to get access to sunscreen from the hospital and also eye care products such as sunglasses and hats from Voy Hospital. However, just recently she told me that uh, there's been an issue, a slight issue with this, because it surprises me, but only in Taita Taveta County does a person with albinism have to prove that they have albinism by showing a card in order to get access to free care, free suns, sunscreen care, free sunscreen, sorry, and eye care products. Up to today, I find it ridiculous. So she's trying to rally this again and try to get people to try to get the hospitals to re renege uh, this idea that you have to have a card to prove that you have albinism when clearly you can see. So why is this project important and why is it necessary? For decades long, people with albinism have been pushed to the margins of society and forgotten, prejudiced against, discriminated, stigmatized, and stereotyped, and even sought after for their body parts. Right now, the sun is the silent killer. The rise in temperature is taking away the lives of innocent people with goals, dreams, and ambition. So I've been doing a lot of research because at the moment I'm not able to travel to Kenya every now and then. <laughs> but through the research that I've been reading, research suggests that without protection from the sun and resulting skin cancer uh, screening for early detection and treatment, few persons of albinism survive until the ages of 40. So I read this when I was, after I finished my master's, I moved to South Korea and I also worked on this project. And this image is actually taken in South Korea. So while I was there for a year, I read this article, which was saying that the sun is a silent killer for people with albinism in Tanzania, especially in Kenya, because it's becoming hotter and hotter and unbearable for them to, to, to even be outside for long times, for a long time, sorry. So uh, when I was reading this article, the first person I called was Felicia. So I went to my WhatsApp and asked her, do you know anyone who is above the ages of 40 and has albinism? And she said, yes. So for me, it was, I wanted to really go back home and try and more like dispute this article because it was written in, a, in the West and in a, with a perspective, with a Western uh, perspective. So I wanted to go back home and see whether I can try and refute this because to me, it doesn't make sense that uh, people with albinism don't live up to the ages of 40, uh, beyond the ages of 40. So as, it, as I mentioned before, as it gets hotter and hotter, it continues to become unbearable for Felicia and other people with albinism. And because of the lack of melanin to protect them from the UV rays, they get these dark spots on their skins. And if these dark spots are left untreated, these lesions become cancerous. So in the same article I was reading, uh, they also say that parents, uh, some parents in Africa, they especially in, in Tanzania, because this article was mainly for, was talking about Tanzania. They say that some parents uh, take their children because they have these dark spots, they think that they are becoming well, they're becoming black. So they leave their children in the sun to continue having dark spots as if it was like, um, uh, sorry, it was like Henry Moss in the beginning where his, his patches of white became turned completely gradually white. So they think it's the vice versa that their children will become dark and black. And 
this is wrong because what they don't know is that these lesions are become are can, if they le if they're left untreated they become cancerous cells and eventually they're affecting their children's health and life so due to this due to ignorance and society due to ignorance societies around the world in the case of africa here and kenya may lack knowledge about albinism Therefore, myths and superstitions continue to persist, such as persons with albinism are often ostracized and excluded. In addition to the stigma and stereotype and discrimination, <clears throat> uh, it results to social isolation and lack of health, access to healthcare services, such as sunscreen and ongoing access to health uh, for skin cancer. Sorry, I, I rumbled there a little bit. <laughs> So the organization that Felicia Mboy started has members coming from remote, from far away places and remote areas. I, Taita Taveta County is where my mother was born. So it's a place I know very well because we used to go on holidays when I was living in Kenya. And it's, to get to a hospital, it's not, it's not easy. It's quite a trek. So most of these people come from different, really far and remote areas. And Felicia, when they are deciding to meet, it would be either once every two months or once a month. And if it's really important and urgent. So they lack, they lack this immediate access to medical help and early detection of developing skin cancer or treatment, which can result, as I mentioned before, to detrimental effects later in their lives. This can also be to an isolated geographic location to access these services and inability to pay for an inappropriate, sorry, appropriate dermatological treatment. What is still prevalent are the myths associated with albinism to spiritual and cultural practices, which can cause some people with albinism to seek medical help from witch doctors and witchcraft. Uh, which are not really informed by any medical knowledge. And as previously mentioned, because societies in back home, they may not have enough knowledge or lack, they may lack the knowledge about albinism and myths and because of, uh, sorry, albinism and myths and superstitions continue to persist. Parents may not be able to be, may not be, parents may not be given uh, sufficient information about their children's conditions. And unless they have organizations like the one that Felicia is running. I also wanted to mention that academic research is needed fully, uh, is needed to fully understand the scope of the problem. And more recently, now that the issue is also to do with the climate crisis due to the rising temperatures, caused for, for example, by the coal plantations that are in Mombasa and the coast. So Mombasa is not too far away from Taita Taveta. It's quite close. Taita Taveta is in the south. And uh, this, this has a serious effect and the this has a serious effect into, into the rise of the temperature, into the rise of the temperature, sorry. Uh, yes, I think, <laughs> I think that that was it for me. But before I finish, I just wanted to mention that sadly, even though the sun is the silent killer for people with albinism in parts of Africa and the world, it will not end unless uh, people believe in medical help that other than this alternative help from witch doctors. But again, how is this possible and how can this be achieved when poverty is one of the major reasons why people with albinism are not able to seek medical help because of how expensive it is? I know I've rumbled a lot at the end, but I just wanted to say thank you so much for this opportunity and for staying longer to listen. Thank you. And I hope you have any questions. I'll be happy to answer. Thanks. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, again, such an interesting topic um, to talk about in relation to climate change. Um, yeah, so we're just going to have, um, for those watching, we're just going to have a little bit of a chat about um, both of the artists' work. But as I said, um, if anyone has any questions, please do send them in um, and we'll go through as many as we can towards uh, the end of the discussion. Um, so I think the first question that I have for you is what, um, inspired the two of you to create work about climate change? Legia, do you want to go first? Okay. <laughs> yeah, for me, well, um, it was 
first uh, also a personal experience. So I tried to, um, I was just fascinated about this idea. And I think nobody understood me in the beginning when I started the project, but uh, in the end, I had to do the process to, um, to get some answers. Um, and I think, yeah, well, it is very, um, the topic of climate change was always very incredibly important for me since a young age. So um, being able to um, wave the, the narration and, and to actually be part of some kind of, you know, research and discovery uh, here um, was very interesting to understand and to develop and yeah. Yeah, and I hope that's, uh, you know, I hope the project also brings some light on the topic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Cynthia, what about you? Yeah, I think for me it was because when I started this project, I was mainly focusing on the history behind albinism. And then when I, I was living in South Korea, I called Felicia, I was talking to Felicia and then she told me that it's really hot, it's getting really hot because I was telling her my experiences in South Korea, the heat was just too much. And then she said that it's hot, but at the time I didn't understand her because where she lives in Mombasa and Taita Taveta, it's always hot. There's never a time that it's warmer. So when she said that it's extremely hot, that's when I knew that actually there is an impact and there is a climate crisis and it is affecting especially people with albinism. So I don't know if that answers your question correctly, but that was one of the reasons why I decided to sort of switch my 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 interests and my my project into something to do with climate crisis affecting people with albinism. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of a, a broader, maybe slightly bigger question would be what role do you think um, photography has on the fight um, against climate change? Obviously that is a massive question, um, but if there's even kind of one or two points that you think that what role as photographers and as people working in the photography industry we have. Um, Leggy, would you like to go first again or Cynthia? Uh. Yeah, I think we, we definitely have to use the platform um, that we have as photographers and visual creators to talk about that. And I think, uh, yeah, na narrating a right story, I think choos choosing wisely uh, in the sea of possibilities um, in order to, to bring something um, to, 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 to uh, talk about the important things but um, I also wanted to, to think uh, to say that it's very I think difficult to um, say not one dimensional story about climate change to avoid the, the full negativity um, which is around mm -hmm. and um, yeah mm -hmm. and as we are living in a visual culture I think um, we also should leave use this um, platform to uh, to also talk to the empathy of people and so on. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I think, Ligia, you hit the nail on the head there when you said about photography is wonderful about narrating stories, but also uh, we are living in a very visual world. I studied psychology with criminology before in my undergraduate, and so I switched to documentary photography because I was, I thought people were not interested in reading the text. They were more in the, we are more visual people. So photography sends the message quicker and it's easily accessible as well. So people are able to receive that message all over the world. And that's why I thought, I'm not sure if that's actually, that's a big question, Zoe. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Um, I know that for me anyway, um, um, which is why I know that um, magazines kind of the deal with more um, kind of perhaps scientific stories. They they always have a picture editor, and that picture editor has such an important role because the illustration of a story is what more often than not, not always I can't say always, but is what draws people in, and that is such an important role um, to have. Um, and, you know, kind of on, on that, climate change is such a huge, colossal, all the superlatives issue that you can't really capture 
where you can't really, as I, as I said earlier, it's impossible to comprehend the impact that it's going to have um, and the impact that it's starting to have already. Both of you um, really focused on a very particular subject. Um, why is it that you focused on, or what benefit do you think it has on telling such specific stories um, over um, perhaps the, the louder stories that we hear in news media? I think for me, in if I have to say that in most parts of the world, albinism affects one in 20,000 people, <laughs> where uh -huh. in Africa, it affects one in 1,000. So <laughs> I think that answers your question. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Hopefully. yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, it does. Yeah, I think, um, well, uh, I think focusing on uh, ma ma macro, uh, stories in uh, in uh, in the face of the, such a colossal issue uh, is um, is in more interesting because then we um, we really focus on something particular, but also um, can get the viewer uh, more um, engaged, maybe. Uh, but for for instance, yeah, I I, I I started from a very personal story, but actually it opened to something um, where people well, other people can relate to and um, well uh, climate anxiety is something uh, which is only grow uh, well will grow uh, mm -hmm. right in the future I hope not but that's unfortunately the forecast um, mm -hmm. yeah I um, I'm a big fan of telling um, uh, very selective small stories on, um, on issues Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, obviously both of your projects are fantastic and it really, um, both stories actually made me think about something that I hadn't thought about before in relation to climate change. Um, so it was really interesting to look at it from an entirely different perspective um, than what I've been used to thinking about it. Um, so with regards to that, what would you say are the primary misconceptions um, that people have on the impact of climate change, obviously from, from your perspective. Oh. Do you want to go? <laughs> you go first. <laughs> Again, another huge question just to, just to you know, really <laughs> push the boat out. Uh, I would say from my project's perspective is um, people don't think that climate change, especially coming from Africa, Kenya, people don't think that it affects Africa and Africans <laughs> and also vice versa. When mm -hmm. I say people, I mean both uh, the West and also Africans don't think it affects them. But clearly when we see it, uh, if we see people on the streets rallying that there's an issue, there's a rise in temperature, there's, a, there's issues with burning coal in different parts of Nigeria and all over the world, I think it's 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 really it's detrimental and it's important that we put our attention to such things. So mm -hmm. maybe that is one of the one one of the for me that is one of the misconception that it does not affect parts of Africa when clearly it does. So yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so we have a question here from Jennifer. Hello Jennifer, thank you for watching. Um, so Jennifer says, thank you for this virtual presentation. It's a pleasure. Um, I find it fascinating that blind individuals dream through other senses, which makes sense, um, which prompts me to Google for more such findings. Um, the question is to Cynthia, um, which is in regards to George. I think it's just asking for further information about um, George Washington and if you knew if there were ever um, any kind of what his reaction was to seeing um, the man with albinism. I'm not sure if you if you know that. Actually, on the article on the PhD thesis, it did it didn't it didn't go it didn't explore further mm -hmm. George Washington's ex uh, reaction. It just said that he came face to face to see Henry Moss and to see to see to see him. So I take that as something that other than his curiosity was fulfilled, but mm. also. Uh, he paid, he paid 25 cents. So that means he, he, he was, he, I don't know how to explain it. It means that he actually, his curiosity was fulfilled, I guess. And he, he deserved to pay this man, this amount of money. So I yeah. take it as a positive, yeah. 
Yeah. But, sorry, I'm sorry, Jennifer. I don't have the right. <laughs> I will, I will look into it more and come back to it. No problem at all. Um, so I think we don't have any more questions. Um, but I think just before I sign off, um, are, you two, are you guys working on anything at the moment that you'd like to draw attention to? Or just generally, where can people find you if they'd like to follow you? Good. Yeah, I'm continuing the series in my free time between work. Um, and I hope to publish a book um in in uh, some time <laughs> um and uh yeah people can find me uh on my website um uh, ligiapopravska.com great all the information is there great and um, Sophia and same I'm hoping to continue the project hopefully go back to Kenya soon and focus on it more and also like Ligia you can find me on my website uh maiva.com maiva mm. Um, and also, if um, both Ligia and Cynthia's information should all be on um, their pages on the British Journal of Photography Decade of Change page, um, if you'd like to find out more about them as well. Um, but yeah, thank you both so much for joining me this evening and for sharing more about both of your incredible bodies of work. Um, I hope everybody that was watching enjoyed as well. I'm sure you did, because you're, Cynthia and Ligia are both fantastic. Um, but yes, I'll do, yes, if you would like to see the full um, exhibition for Decade of Change in Belfast, as I said, it's at Donegal Keys next to, um, it starts at the iconic Big Fish, which if you're from Belfast or you've ever been from Belfast, you know exactly where I'm talking about. Um, and to find out more about our awards, you can find, you can go to 1854.photography forward slash awards. Um, but besides that, I just wanted to say thank you both Cynthia and Ligia for taking the time to speak to me this evening. Um, Rebecca, thank you for saying thank you. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for this. And Ligia, amazing. Your work is just amazing. Oh, you're too. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, guys, uh, Zoe, for um for all, everything you did here and um uh, belfast photo festival and british journal of photography we are incredibly honored to be able to speak about our work and uh present it here thank you so much thank you absolute pleasure have a wonderful evening everyone bye